Hello listeners and hello video viewers because this is also on YouTube. Uh, welcome to episode 779 of my podcast for learners of English. This is in fact part two of a two-part episode. In part one of this, which was episode 778, I talked to my dad about an old poem from the medieval period in Britain. The poem is basically a really mysterious and wonderfully descriptive adventure about a knight from King Arthur's table at Camelot. King Arthur was a mythical king of Britain who people told and wrote stories about many centuries ago. We're not sure if he really existed, if the stories about him are all fictional or some combination of those two things. Anyway, the Arthurian legends or stories of King Arthur and his knights uh, from Camelot are full of magic, chivalry and adventure. Chivalry, by the way, means the rules that all honourable knights had to follow, a kind of code of honour. Anyway, the poem I talked about with my dad in the last episode is about one of Arthur's knights who accepts a strange and dangerous challenge. The poem is called Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. If you listened to episode 778, which I think is the last episode I published, uh, you heard my dad describing the story of the poem, the linguistic style and how it fits into British history and the history of the English language. If you haven't heard the previous episode, then I suggest that you go ahead and do that. Um, at the end of the episode, I read some verses from a modernised version of the poem by Simon Armitage. In this episode, I'd like to read some more verses from the poem but this time I'd like to explain some of the vocabulary and other aspects of the language while I'm doing it. So here you will be able to hear part of a medieval poem written in Middle English, which has been updated into Modern English with explanations and comments from me. Again, the poem is called Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. It was probably written in England in the 14th century, probably around the year 1370. Since this text was discovered, it has been studied and translated into modern English and is now considered one of the greatest works of medieval English literature. Modernised versions have been published, including one by J.R.R. Tolkien, the author of The Lord of the Rings and another modernised version more recently by Simon Armitage, the Poet Laureate. Uh, the one I'm going to read from here is the modernised version by Simon Armitage, which is available as a book from W.W. W. Norton and Company. That's the publisher. You can get this book from any good bookshop. It's called Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, uh, Simon Armitage. I do recommend it. It has a really interesting introduction and it presents both the modernised version and the original text in Middle, in Middle English side by side. Although Middle English, as you heard me talk about in the last episode, if you heard it, Middle English is really very different to um, uh, Modern English and not really many people can read it or understand it these days which is just totally normal. But anyway, it's quite interesting to at least have a look at the original Middle English version. And in the Simon Armitage version of this book, you get um, you get a page of the old, uh, old version, the Middle English version, and then a page of the modernised version. So it's quite interesting to compare them. Um, in terms of language, there are three main things to notice. Um, so these linguistic features or poetic devices were all present in the original version and Simon Armitage has done a great job of replicating them in this modern version. So here are some things to notice in terms of language. So first of all, there's the alliteration. This is when the same sounds are used at the beginnings of words, as my dad explained in the previous episodes. Uh, when the same sounds are used at the beginning of at the beginnings of words, it's a sort of uh, a rhyming style, and it creates a kind of rhythm or music to the lines. For example, here are some examples from the poem: a fearful form appeared framed in the door. So that's the repetition of the f sound. A fearful form appeared framed in the door. A mountain of a man immeasurably high. That's alliteration of of m m sounds. 
a hulk of a human from head to hips. That's alliteration of the h sound, a hulk of a human from head to hips. So long and thick in his loins and his limbs. That's alliteration of, of L sounds, L sounds. So long and thick in his loins and his limbs. I should genuinely judge him to be a half giant. Or a half giant. I should genuinely judge him to be a half giant. So J sounds. Or a most massive man, the mightiest of mortals. So that's the alliteration of M sounds, M sounds. So the second thing to notice is the bob and wheel, which again, my dad explained in the last episode. This is a poetic device which can be found in poems from this medieval period, from this era. Each stanza, that's each group of lines, ends with two syllables, that's the bob, and then four flowing lines which follow, that's the wheel. So here, here's an example of that. So listen a little while to my tale, if you will, and I'll tell it as it's told in the town where it trips from the tongue. And, it, and as it has been inked in stories bold and strong, through letters which, once linked, have lasted loud and long. So there's the bob, which is the two syllables of the tongue, the town where it trips from the tongue, and then the following four lines are known as the wheel. Okay, um, all right then. And thirdly, we have descriptive vocabulary. So the poem is full of vivid descriptions and Simon Armitage has managed to modernize the vocabulary. So all the language used here is, well, let's say, I'm not say all, maybe most of, most of the language used here is up to date and is still used by people today. Certainly compared to the Middle English version, which is, in some regard, unrecognisable uh, if you're looking for normal English. Um, the Middle English one is like really antiquated. Uh, this modernised version um, is, uh, for the most part, full of the sort of English that we use today. Okay, but it does maintain that bob and wheel and that alliteration, which are so important. So let's get into the poem. I'll, I'll read each verse and I'm just going to read a section just a, a few uh, parts of the, oh, the, the poem itself is very long. It's, you know, it's a, a full book, a book's worth of, of writing. Um, I'm just gonna read a bit of it. So I'll read each verse one by one, and then I'll go back through and explain the language that I've read, okay? If you want, you could try to repeat the lines of the poem after me. That would be a good way to practice your pronunciation. Okay, just try and repeat what I'm saying. It would be a very good exercise. So I'm going to start reading from line 130. And just to bring you up to speed with the story, here is uh, what happens between lines 1 and, and 129. So here's the story so far. So the poem begins by referring to Greek mythology. It briefly describes the fall of Troy and the foundation of Rome, and it makes a clear connection between King Arthur of Britain and those heroes from Greek and Roman mythology. It's Christmas time in Camelot, in this castle, and King Arthur is celebrating with a big feast. So a feast, that's a, a big meal which lasts for a long time. The poem describes the celebrations, the food, the games they've been playing, the decorations, the seating arrangement with all the knights, ladies and their guests. King Arthur's, King Arthur's wife Guinevere is there and the poem describes how beautiful she is. They're about to, they're just about to start eating when the celebration is interrupted by something extraordinary. And this is where we got to in the last episode. So I'm now gonna open this up. So what I've got here, is a PDF of the book. Uh, okay, so just to show you, here's the uh, front page of the book. So Gawain and the Green Knight, Simon Armitage. I'm going to skip forwards through the through the introduction, which is very interesting. Gives you lots of interesting background um, about the language and other details. So we're going to get through all of that. It, it gives you information about the English meter. Right, right. Come on. So let's find line 130. Now, okay, so what you can see there, have a look at that. If you're watching the video version, you'll see this. 
This is the original Middle English version. Now, while I of whore service, service say yow no more, for uch, we may well wit no want that there were. You can see that this is not English as we know it today. But don't worry, we're going to we're going to read from the modernized version. So here we go. Okay, ready? So now on the subject of supper, I'll say no more, as it's obvious to everyone that no one went without. Because another sound, a new sound, suddenly drew near, which might signal the king to sample his supper. For barely had the horns finished blowing their breath, and with starters just spooned to the seated guests, a fearful form appeared framed in the door. A mountain of a man, immeasurably high, a hulk of a human from head to hips, so long and thick in his loins and his limbs, I should genuinely judge him to be a half-giant, or a most massive man, the mightiest of mortals, but handsome too, like any horseman worth his horse, for despite the bulk and brawn of his body, his stomach and waist were slender and sleek. In fact, in all features, he was finely formed, it seemed. Amazement seized their minds. No soul had ever seen a knight of such kind, entirely emerald green. Okay, so let's go back through that section again. I'll try and explain it. Okay, so as I said before, so King Arthur and his knights and all his guests and everyone and the, the Queen Guinevere and the rest of them have been celebrating Christmas. And this celebration was interrupted uh, by the arrival of this strange visitor who is green from head to toe, completely dressed in green and strong, powerful man. Okay, so I'll go through it line by line. Now on the subject of supper, I'll say no more which is basically, supper is just like a, another word for a, a late dinner, basically. Now, I guess Simon Armitage, when he um, translated this, he also had to try and find ways to keep the alliteration. So it's very clever what he's managed to do, which is to find words which start with the same letter. You know, he's been forced to include other words. So they're having a dinner, essentially a supper, is another word for a dinner. Normally it's a, um, a late dinner. Okay, it's sort of a, a slightly later dinner. So that's a supper. On the subject of supper, I'll say no more, meaning I won't talk more about the supper, about the dinner. As it's obvious to everyone that no one went without. So it's obvious to all of us that everyone had plenty of food and that no one was left, left out. Everyone had food and plenty of food and drink to enjoy. Because another sound, a new sound, suddenly drew near. That's quite clear. Another sound, a new sound, suddenly drew near, meaning it came close. Suddenly they were able to hear another sound. Which might signal the king to sample his supper. Now, i will be honest with you, I'm not sure why that sound would signal the king to sample his supper. Sample would be taste. Maybe it was a loud fanfare or something like that, or some noise that um, the king might have mistaken for a gong or some other sound which uh, announced the beginning of the, the dinner. Maybe he, he, he heard a noise. Maybe it was a booming sound or a gong, you know, like a big metal gong or something like that, which he could easily have mistaken for the sign that the dinner was going to start. But in fact, it wasn't that. I think it was the sound of um, of probably the door, the wooden doors, boom, opening, something like that. Okay. For barely had the horns finished blowing their breath. If something has barely happened, it means it's... Well, in this case, for barely had the horns finished blowing their breath, meaning the horns, so the trumpets, had just finished, um, you know... The, the sound had just finished coming out of the trumpets, da -da -da -da, meaning it's now time to, to eat. Uh, barely had that happened. 
that a fearful form appeared. So basically, the horns had just finished blowing the fanfare to announce the beginning of dinner. Um, although I think that maybe the sound of the door opening also um, happened at this time. Uh, that's when the man appeared. Okay, so the horns had just finished making their noise. They'd just finished blowing. Breath is normally the air that comes out of a person when you breathe. That's your breath. But in this case, the breath coming out of the horns. And with starters just spooned to the seated guests. So yeah, spoon, you know what a spoon is, but spoon can also be a, a verb. You can spoon food to the guests as well. So the starters, these are the, this is the first course of this feast, had just been spooned to the seated guests. More alliteration, starters spooned, seated. A fearful form appeared. A fearful form, a frightening shape appeared framed in the door so it's quite cinematic in its description you can imagine the door boom, opening and this shape of this figure standing there in the doorway a mountain of a man immeasurably high if something is immeasurable it means you can't measure measure it so it's like basically saying amazingly high or incredibly high so high that you know, you wouldn't be able to measure it. Although, I mean, I think you probably could measure it, but it's just a uh, descriptive language. Sort of a mountain of a man, like so high, it's unbelievable. Uh, a hulk of a human from head to hips. I'm curious to know if the word hulk was also in, mi in Middle English. If we go back. Um, no, it's not. So Simon Armitage has, has gone with this, but Hulk obviously is not the Incredible Hulk. The word existed before the Incredible Hulk from the Marvel movies arrived. But a Hulk is like basically a very big, um, extremely large, probably very muscular um, form. In this case, a Hulk of a human from head to hips. Okay, nice, again, nice alliteration. So long and thick in his loins. So loins refers to a body part, and it's essentially the part from the bottom of the ribs down to the groin. So it's the sort of the lower part of the thorax, the stomach, and the lower part of the stomach going down towards the groin between the legs. That whole section is the loins. Okay, so uh, so long and thick in his loins and limbs. So this is describing the physique of this green knight who sounds like sort of like, a, I don't know, like a kind of a, 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 an Arnold Schwarzenegger type sort of bodybuilder, lean but thick and muscular in his limbs. Limbs, these are your arms and legs. I should genuinely judge him to be a half giant. So, meaning I would, I would say that he was n not just a human, but a half giant. That's clear. Or a, or a most massive man, the mightiest of mortals. The mightiest, meaning the largest and strongest of mortals. Mortals are, you know, humans, mortal men, not gods. If you're m mortal, if you're mortal, it means you're, you can die. If you're immortal, it means you can't die and probably would be a, a god or something like that. But handsome too, like any horseman worth his horse. A horseman, I suppose, is a horse rider. If, you're, if a horseman is worth his horse, it means that he is as strong and as impressive as the horse. And if, you've, if you're worth your horse, I suppose it means that you've trained and you've become an excellent rider. Um, okay, so like any excellent horse rider or an excellent knight, uh, would be handsome, you know, strong enough and uh, and confident and bold enough to handle a horse. Um, for despite the bulk, for here means because, for despite the bulk and brawn of his body, bulk is like size and weight and brawn would be strength. Despite the bulk and brawn of his body, his stomach and waist were slender and sleek. Slender meaning slim, not exactly thin, but yeah, not fat, slim, and sleek. Sleek means smooth, 
basically, smooth and contoured. So quite a, a, dis quite a description of this Green Knight's body. In fact, in all features he was finely formed. In fact, in all features he was finely formed, it seemed. So there's the bob, which is quite a good effect. It sort of gives a rhythmic punch at the end of this verse. His stomach and waist were slender and sleek. In fact, in all features he was finely formed, it seemed. For wonder, oh, this is the Middle English version. Let me go forward. Amazement seized their minds. No soul had ever seen, meaning no one, no person, no one in the room, had ever seen a knight of such kind, entirely emerald green. So emerald is a, a jewel, right? A precious stone that's green. You know, we get rubies and sapphires and emeralds, and emeralds are green. Entirely emerald green. Mm -hmm. As I take a sip from my tea, which of course is green today, green tea, green tea, green t-shirt. Okay. Mm-hmm. Let's carry on. So, let's move on to the next verse, or next stanza, I guess you can call it. So, and his gear and garments were green as well, a tight-fitting tunic tailored to his torso, and a cloak to cover him, the cloth fully lined, with smoothly shorn fur clearly showing, and faced with an all-white ermine, as was the hood, worn shawled on his shoulders, shucked from his head. On his lower limbs his leggings were also green, wrapped closely round his calves, and his sparkling spurs were green gold, strapped with stripy silk, and were set on his stockings, for this stranger was shoeless. In all vestments he revealed himself veritably verdant. From his belt hooks and buckle to the baubles and gems, arrayed so richly around his costume, and adorning the saddle stitched onto silk. All the details of his dress are difficult to describe, embroidered as it was with butterflies and birds. Green beads emblazoned on a background of gold. All the horse's tack, harness strap, hind strap, the eye of the bit, each alloy and enamel, and the stirrups he stood in were similarly tinted, and the same with the cantle and the skirts of the saddle, all glimmering and glinting with the greenest jewels. And the horse, every hair was green, from hoof to mane, a steed of pure green stock, each snort and shudder strained. The hand-stitched bridle, but his rider had him reined. Okay, this is going to be really difficult for me to explain because there's some very, very difficult, uh, well, difficult, very specific words here. So again, this whole section is just devoted to explaining in lots of detail uh, what this Green Knight looked like and how he was dressed. So this line, and his gear and garments were green as well. So gear, gear refers to equipment, okay? So gear it could refer to lots of different kinds of things. So, for example, we might use gear, the word gear, to talk about, you know, um, recording equipment like microphones and headphones, this sort of thing. This is gear. But also gear could be clothing as well, right? Though so gear, to get some new gear, means to get some new clothes. But in this case, for the, in the case of this knight, it includes all of the different types of clothing and uh, different accessories that he has, and the things that the horse is also wearing, including the staddle, the staddle, no, the saddle and the stirrups and the reins, and all the different types of decoration uh, that the knight and his horse are wearing. So that's what we, that's what is meant by gear. Garments, meaning clothes or clothing items. All his gear and garments were green as well. A tight-fitting tunic. A tunic is a sort of waistcoat, basically, that would be uh, fastened at the front. A waistcoat without sleeves. Uh, tailored to his torso. Your torso is basically your body. The body, the chest and the stomach and the back and the sides. This is the torso without the arms. So that's just the, this whole section is called the torso. Um, and tailored means that it's been, this tunic has been fitted so it fits 
uh, this guy perfectly, right? This guy, this green guy, tailored. If you get a tailored suit, it means you go to a special place and they measure you. They measure, you know, your arms and the size of your chest and the rest of it. And then they cut and uh, make the suit that's perfectly designed for your body, for your measurements. Then you have a tailored suit. The suit has been tailored to your body. Um, yes, so a tight-fitting tunic tailored to his torso. That means that the tunic has, was perfectly designed to fit his body. And a cloak to cover him. A cloak is... Um, like a long item of clothing that um, normally you wear on your back, a bit like um, superheroes have cloaks, right? No, superheroes have capes, slightly different. Superman has a cape. It's a long uh, piece of fabric that hangs down his back. But a cape could go all the way around. It's like a, sorry, a cloak can go all the way around. It's like a cape. Uh, but instead of stopping just at your shoulders, you can pull the cape all the way around and you can fasten it at the front and it would fall all the way down to your to your legs. That's a cape. Uh, sorry, that's a cloak, I mean. So a cloak to cover him. The cloth, that's the fabric of the cloak, fully lined. So the inside of this cloak uh, is lined with a certain type of fabric. In, in fact, it's lined with fur. This is animal skin with the hair of the animal on it. So animals have fur, right? Humans have hair, right? Um, humans have hair. Animals have fur on their bodies. And also, you know, if, uh, if an animal has been killed and the, the skin and hair has been taken to create clothing, that, that could also be called fur, like a fur coat. So the cloth of this cloak is, is lined with smoothly shorn fur shorn meaning cut okay uh, so it's smoothly cut fur so the fur is very uh short okay and very smooth uh so the the lining of this this cloak is uh it's lined with this smooth short fur which is clearly showing and faced with an all white ermine now i actually don't know what an ermine is Okay, don't judge me. I know you're you're amazed. You can't like what? Luke doesn't know a word. Yeah, ermine. Am I even pronounced? Yeah, uh, ermine. 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 Ermine is expensive white fur that comes from small animals called stoats. Let's see if I can see. If... Oh, poor little cute stoat. Oh, so that's that's a kind of uh, animal. But uh, my ermine um, cloak. Let's have a little, see if we can pick, let's find a picture of an ermine cloak. Okay, yeah. The sort of thing that um, members of the royal family would have worn in, uh, for traditional purposes. We see a picture of King Henry VIII wearing an ermine cloak. And in fact, there's a picture of Prince Charles, but this is from the TV show The Crown. And the character, the actor playing Prince Charles here in this scene is wearing an ermine cloak. And then we've got a picture of Prince Charles himself, I think. Anyway, so and that, that's King, uh, King George V in an ermine coat. So they, uh, an ermine cloak. That's a cloak, folks. So anyway, going back to this. So, um, right, so this is just describing the cloak uh, and the hood of the cloak as well, covered in this white ermine fur. Uh, the, the, this cloak was worn shawled on his shoulders. Shawled basically means kind of like um, held back on his shoulders like that. Shucked from his head. This is the hood, right? The hood was lying flat on his shoulders and uh, removed from his head. On his lower limbs, on his legs basically, his leggings were also green. Leggings are like tight trousers wrapped closely round his calves. Calves are the muscles on the back of the lower part of your legs, okay? Calf muscles, C-A-L-F, and calves, C-A-L-V-E-S. These are the, the muscles on the back of the lower part of your legs. Video viewers, there you go, there are my calf muscles. 
little special bonus there for the video viewers you got to see the back of one of the, the lower half of my right leg whoa so exciting i'm not quite as um well built as the green knight though so um so it's trousers tightly wrapped around his calves the muscles on his lower legs and his sparkling spurs were green gold spurs are metal points on the back of your feet or shoes which you use when you're riding a horse and you can sort of prod the horse poke the horse with these metal spikes to make the horse run is that cruel probably i don't know but it's just the way that uh, horse riders kick the horse with their heels and the metal spikes kind of poke the horse and make you know encourage the horse to run these are spurs sparkling spurs shining bright because they're so shiny they're sparkling they were green gold strapped with stripy silk silk is that shiny uh fabric stripy means that there are lines decorative lines in it along the length of the of the um of the silk silk straps and were set on his stockings stockings are these long socks so the the spurs were set on his stockings the spurs were attached to his socks because this stranger was shoeless not wearing any shoes strange in all vestments he revealed himself veritably verdant again clever use of words to get this alliteration with these v sounds these v sounds uh vestments meaning clothes basically he revealed himself veritably like truly verdant meaning green from his belt hooks and buckle belt hooks when you put your belt on your your belt goes through hooks in your trousers these are loops i would say uh are they is that what we mean or do we mean the metal part which which clips the belt together to it onto itself i think that's what that means his belt hooks hooks the so you've got a metal pin which hooks onto the buckle of the belt that's what that is the belt hook is the metal pin that goes through the leather of the belt and attaches to the buckle which is the metal piece that goes around right that's how a, a belt works so the belt hook clips onto the buckle of the of the belt and uh, the baubles and gems gems meaning stones you know like you know emeralds and so on uh, decorative shiny stones and baubles are decorative uh, round things round decorations uh, christmas trees often are decorated with baubles so um, a you know round shiny balls which are used to decorate things so from his belt hooks and buckle to the baubles and gems arrayed so richly around his costume so his clothing is decorated by these gems and baubles and so on and they're green as well and adorning the saddle uh decorating the saddle the saddle is the thing that's put onto the horse that the horse rider would sit on it's like the seat which goes on the horse's back so um these adorning the saddle stitched onto silk okay so there are baubles and gems on the guy's clothing and also on the saddle uh stitched in stitched onto silk so the saddle is covered in a kind of silk which is a very luxurious shiny fabric all the details of his dress are difficult to describe all the details of his clothing are difficult to describe embroidered as it was with butterflies and birds embroidery is when you take needle and thread and you make patterns or pictures by sewing uh thread into into fabric okay to embroider like that it's it's sewing thread with a needle into fabric and uh making a making a picture so his clothes were embroidered with butterflies and birds green beads beads are uh, little normally little round things with holes in them which decorate necklaces green beads emblazoned on a background of gold emblazoned emblazoned what a lovely word <clears throat> emblazoned if something is emblazoned with a design words or letters they are clearly drawn painted or sewn onto it okay so for example a luke's english podcast t-shirt 
is emblazoned with the Luke's English Podcast logo. In this case, um, green beads are emblazoned on the background of gold. Maybe this embroidery also includes beads as well. And the beads are emblazoned on a, black, on a background of gold. So basically, the Green Knight looks really impressive. All the horses tack, so that's all of the equipment on the horse. The harness strap, so a strap is a normally made of leather or maybe rope, which is used to attach the harness. Uh, you know, a strap is like a belt. It's used to attach something to something else. So you have the, um, what's the most common thing you have straps on? On a bag, you know, you have straps on a bag. I'll give you an example here of my bag. So uh, audio listeners, I'm getting, I'm showing you my backpack and the backpack has got two straps that go over the top and they uh, attach the uh, top of the bag and, and the, the straps come down and clip onto the front of the bag and I can, um, I can extend these straps or reduce the, sl the straps with uh, a little buckle on each one, a bit like a belt. Okay, so uh, all the horses tack, all the horses equipment, the harness strap, the, the thing used to connect the harness to the horse. The harness is essentially the, all the leather parts that go over the horse's head, including the, the reins, which are the leather straps that you, that you hold onto when riding the horse. So the harness strap, the hind strap, that's the strap at the back, and the eye of the bit, that's the metal piece that goes into the horse's mouth, because, you know, that's all part of the tack. The, 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 the bit, the metal bit that goes into the horse's mouth, each alloy and enamel, alloy means, you know, uh, metal basically, and enamel, that's a sort of um, um, a kind of material, a sort of um, um, porcelain material. And the stirrups he stood in were similarly tinted. Stirrups, these are the things that the feet go in, in a horse. Um, in a horse? You know, put your feet in a horse. <laughs> the things your feet go in um, when riding a horse. These are little metal loops or little metal steps which are attached to the whole harness strap. The feet go into the stirrups and that's where, the, that's where your feet sit when you are riding the horse. So the, the, uh, the stirrups he stood in were similarly tinted, meaning similarly coloured. And the same with the cantle and the skirts of the saddle, right? I'm not sure what the cantle is. Let's have a look at this. Obviously, I know what a candle is. You know, candles are made of wax, but this is a cantle. The cantle is the back part of a saddle that slopes upwards. Oh, okay. So when you're sitting on a saddle, um, there's the, the part of the saddle, the part of the seat that slopes up at the back. Um, okay, we can see a picture of a saddle here. Uh, the cantle is the part that slopes up and you can sort of rest your lower back against it. Okay. The same with the cantle and the skirts of the saddle, the skirts of the sides, basically, the sides that come down. Um, all glimmering, that's, that's like shining, sort of, and glinting. So this is when light, is, light reflects off things, they glimmer and glint with the greenest jewels. And the horse, every hair was green from hoof to mane. So again, the horse, as well as the rider, is completely green. From hoof, ho a hoof is the word for a horse's foot. Okay, horses don't have feet, they have hooves. <coughs> hooves. And mane, the mane is the hair on the back of the horse's head and neck. A lot of horse vocabulary here, folks. A steed of pure green stock. Steed is another word for a horse. Um of pure green stock. Stock means that the, um, the sort of family line of that horse. So if this horse comes from good stock, it means that it's the parents of that horse and the parents of its parents are all very purely bred. Like, for example, if you are trying to breed race horses, horses for racing, then you need good stock. You need uh, the horse to come from a family of other good horses. 
a steed of pure green stock, each snort and shudder strained. Snort is <laughs> when the horse blows air out of its nose quickly, and shudder is, I guess, you know, moments when the horse shakes for whatever reason, maybe because it's putting its feet down. It's each snort and shudder strained the hand stitched bridle. So, um, okay, I need to check what a bridle is now. I've had this actually, I've had the word bridle on the podcast before in an episode last year with Fred Iango. But a bridle is a set of straps put around the horse's head and mouth so that the person riding or driving the horse can control it. That's the bridle around the head with the bit in there, the um, reins, the saddle, okay, the stirrups on the side, but the bridle is the part, the straps that go around the head and the mouth. So um, the hand stitched bridle. So every time the horse moved or did something, it strained the bridle. So clearly this is a very strong and powerful horse, but the rider had him reined. So the rider had him under con had the horse under control by holding onto the reins of the horse. So it's a very impressive vision of this green knight who's just appeared in the doorway on this incredible horse. Uh, this knight who's strong and powerful and muscular, but also somehow slender and um, handsome uh, on this incredible horse. So let me continue reading. The fellow in green was in fine fettle. The hair of his head was as green as his horse. Fine flowing locks which fanned across his back plus a bushy green beard growing down to his breast. And his face hair, along with the hair of his head, was lopped in a line at elbow length. So half his arms were gra so half his arms were gowned in green growth, crimped at the collar like a king's cape. The mane of his mount was groomed to match, combed and knotted into curlicues, then tinselled with gold, tied and twisted green over gold, green over gold. The fetlocks were finished in the same fashion, with bright green ribbon braided with beads, as was the tail to its tippity tip, and a long tied thong lacing it tight was strung with gold bells which, ra which resounded and shone. No waking man had witnessed such a warrior, or weird warhorse, otherworldly yet flesh and bone. A look of lightning flashed from somewhere in his soul. The force of that man's fist would be a thunderbolt. Wow. Okay. So again, describing the Green Knight in yet more detail. And the end of that, quite impressive, showing that, wow, everyone suddenly realises that this Green Knight would be incredibly strong and powerful. Just in case you didn't get it already from the last verse. The fellow in green was in fine fettle. Fellow means man or person. The guy, the fellow, normally a man. The fellow in green was in fine fettle. If you're in fine fettle, it means you're in good health, in good shape. Um, the hair of his head was as green as his horse. Okay, fine flowing locks which fanned across his back. Fine, good condition. He's probably using a very good shampoo. Maybe he's born with it, or maybe it's Maybelline. <laughs> I think he's born with it in this case. Fine flowing locks, so the, the locks means his hair, right? I don't really have any locks, long locks to speak of at the moment. Uh, but this green knight, his locks were fine and flowing. So f sort of uh, flowing out from his head. Uh, fine flowing locks, which fanned across his back. So they, they were spread out across his back, a bit like a fan. You know those fans that you open when it's hot in the summer? You open it out and then cool yourself down. So spread out like that. Uh, fine flowing locks, which fanned across his back plus a bushy green beard. So a bushy beard is a big thick beard on his face, on his chin. A bushy green beard growing down to his breast. So down to the sort of upper, down to his, the middle of his chest. A big 
green beard uh, growing down to his his chest and his face hair that's his beard and moustache along with the hair of his head was lopped in a line at elbow length so I guess the beard goes all the way down to where his elbows are all the way down to his the middle of his chest and so does the hair on his head also goes down to elbow length and then it's lopped it's cut in a line so the beard comes all the way down to the chest and he's cut in a line and the hair also comes down to the same spot on his back and he's cut in a line there as well quite an impressive hairstyle and beard combination here the uh the envy of any hipster that you would see <laughs> um so his face hair along with the hair of his head was lopped in a line at elbow length so half his arms were gowned in green growth so his his arms were also covered like a gown like a dress or something his arms were also covered in this green growth so what uh, he must have looked like sort of like a forest a mountain of a man um crimped at the collar like a king's cape crimped crimped isn't crimped does that mean folded or or turned in some way there's another one i've got to check crimped folded into ridges or having tight curls or waves how pretty so the hair at the collar here was kind of crimped meaning it curled or folded very attractive haircut i wonder how long he spent getting his hair done before he turned up at camelot on that day it's like yeah um you know you can imagine the green knight going to his hairdresser and the hairdresser's like same thing again is it like you know mountain style is it is that what you want yeah but you know i'm, I'm going to camelot so i really want to make a good impression so can you give me a little crimp just at the back there at the collar and make sure it's lopped in a line here at elbow length that's probably what he said when he went to the hairdresser anyway he was uh half his arms were gowned in green growth crimped at the collar like a king's cape a cape we know it's what superheroes wear a cape the mane of his mount again the hair on the back of the horse's head and neck was groomed to match groomed meaning combed and fashioned and tied in a certain way yeah combed so comb that's you know uh when you uh, straighten your hair with a with a uh, a comb the b is silent so it's comb not comb and combed not combed combed and knotted so that night knotted when little knots are tied into i guess the the hair on the back of the uh, horse's head the mane has been knotted into curlicues curlicues i suppose these are little lovely attractive little loops or bows or something like that i suppose what are curlicues curlicues are decorative twists and curls okay little twists and curls how pretty so the mane of the horse is groomed and combed and knotted into little loops and curls then tinseled with gold tied and twisted tinsel is that shiny decorative stuff that you again you would put on a christmas tree so the 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 hair of on the mane of the horse has had gold thread put into it as well uh and then uh twisted and tied green over gold green over gold so i guess the the, the gold tinsel has been added into the hair the green hair the fetlocks were finished in the same fashion fetlocks uh, probably the hair on the back end of the horse i'm i'm guessing the tail um the horse's fetlock is the back part of its leg just above the hoof okay so the very lower part of the leg on the back uh above the hoof i guess there's hair there that you can fashion in some way as well so the fetlocks were finished in the same fashion with bright green ribbon braided with beads as was the tail to its tippity tip so the tail was also fashioned in this way all the way down to the very end or to the tippity tip 
and a long tied thong lacing it tight. Uh, a thong would be a A long tied thong lacing it tight. I suppose this is a thin piece of fabric wrapped around the tail at the end. Normally a thong, there's two meanings of thong really commonly used. One is thongs that you wear on your feet. These are flip flops, those sandals where there's a, a bit that goes between your thumb and your, your first uh, toe, right? They stick on like that, it goes through that. You know, that, those Brazilian uh, flip flops. Have uh, oh, I can never remember how to say the Havaianas. Havaianas. You know those flip flops. They they have a thong in the front between the toe and the uh, and the first uh, between the toe and the th and the big toe. Did I say thumb before? I didn't mean you don't have a thumb on your foot. You got thumbs on your hands and um, you got big toes on your feet. So a thong with flip flops. Uh, the thong goes between the big toe and the little and the the next toe. The other mean another type of thong is the thong that some people wear when they go to the beach uh, around their groin, right? And the thong is like a pair of pants that holds your uh, private parts in place, but then there's a little line that goes up the bum crack at the back. That's also a thong revealing the bum cheeks in all their glory. I don't think the Green Knight was wearing one of these, but may, you never know, underneath those uh, leggings, maybe he had a, some sort of green thong on. <laughs> I don't think the poem goes into that much detail. So anyway, so basically the horse is covered in green and gold and it looks beautiful with a thong lacing up the tail in some way. Uh, it was strung with gold bells, which resounded and shone. So the tail has st it's strung means meaning these gold bells are attached with string and the the bells resounded meaning they 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 went ding 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 and they shone meaning sh they had a shine to them okay no waking man had witnessed such a warrior no waking man no man alive had witnessed had seen such a warrior or weird warhorse otherworldly Nice word. If something's otherworldly, it's strange and weird, like it comes from a different world. Whoa, weird, otherworldly. So this strange warrior and or, or warhorse, otherworldly yet flesh, meaning yet real, made you know uh, uh, living creatures, made of flesh and bone. So flesh and bone. That is a uh, combination of words that often goes together. Flesh and bone, meaning real. Or matter, organic matter. So, no waking man had witnessed such a warrior or weird warhorse, otherworldly, yet flesh and bone. A look of lightning flashed from somewhere in his soul. Wow, a look of lightning on his face. <coughs> lightning is the electricity that comes down from the sky. <coughs> lightning flashed from somewhere in his soul. The force of that man's fist would be a thunderbolt. Again, a thunderbolt is, is lightning that comes down from the sky. Like, poof, very powerful. Yeah, it's like something from a Marvel movie, but a thousand years before Marvel movies existed. Or like something from Street Fighter 2, or some kind of Japanese anime, um, but in medieval literature. Okay, let's keep trucking. Um, okay, I'm 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 trying to decide here how much more I should read to you uh, because I do want to. I mean, you can see the level of detail. Um, lots. This is mostly detail and not much action at this point. But I do want to get to the point where uh, the axe gets involved. Mm hmm. OK, so we're going to I'm going to paraphrase a little bit here. So basically, the, the Green Knight is also carrying a big axe, which is incredibly powerful. It's forged of green steel. It's a skull busting blade. So the blade of the axe is so powerful, poof, it could break your skull. Um, it could shear a man's scalp and shave him. So the the axe was incredibly powerful, but also very, very sharp. 
it, it was sharp enough to shave a person. Um, mm -mm 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 -mm. Okay, so let's carry on from um, line number 220. And he kicks on, canters through the crowded hall, towards the top table, not the least bit timid, cocksure of himself, sitting high in the saddle. And who, he bellows, without breaking breath, is governor of this gaggle? I'll be glad to know. It's with him and him alone that I'll have my say. The green man steered his gaze deep into every eye, explored each person's face to probe for a reply. Okay, so he kicks on, meaning he kicks the horse with his stirrups, with his, no, with his spurs. He kicks the horse with his spurs to move on canters through the crowded hall to canter is to move not walk but a like jog he cantered through the crowded hall towards the top table the table at the end where king arthur would have been sitting not the least bit timid so not timid at all timid means shy so not not a, not in the least bit timid not shy at all cock sure of himself Someone who's cocksure, it means that they are confident. Cocksure, confident. Uh, cocksure of himself, or you could just say sure of himself. Sitting high in the saddle. Sitting up high like this in the saddle, all cocksure and confident. And who he bellows. So to bellow is to... Um, to speak very loudly. And who, he bellows, without breaking breath. So he says all of this without having to breathe. He says, and who is governor of this gaggle? I'll be glad to know. It's with him and him alone I'll have my say. It's quite difficult to, to say all of that in one breath, but that's what he did because you can imagine the, the power of this guy's lungs and everything. So who is, who is governor of this gaggle? A gaggle is a group of people. Just a group of people? Or is there more to it than that? Yeah, a noisy or disorganised group of people. So he's kind of being a bit uh, insulting, perhaps. Who's governor of this gaggle? Who's in charge? I'll be glad to know because it's with him and, and him alone. So it's only with him that I'll have my say. So I only want to speak to whoever's in charge. The green man steered his gaze, so he turned his gaze. He, he, he moved his head to look around the room, deep into every eye. So he stared at everybody in the room, explored each person's face to probe for a reply. He looked at everyone's face to try to find a reply. The guests looked on. They gaped and they gawked and were mute with amazement. What did it mean that human and horse could develop this hue? Should grow to be grass green or greener still, like green enamel emboldened by bright gold? Some stood and stared, then stepped a little closer. Drawn near to the knight to know his next move, they'd seen some sights, but this was something special. A miracle or magic, or so they imagined. Yet several of the lords were like statues in their seats, left speechless and rigid, not risking a response. The hall fell hushed, as if all who were present had slipped into sleep or some trance-like state, no doubt. Not all were stunned and stilled by dread, but duty-bound to hold their tongues until their sovereign could respond. Okay, so the, the, the guests looked on, meaning the guests just watched. They gaped and they gawked. So this describes the expressions on their faces. They gaped, meaning uh, they stood there or sat there with their mouths open. Uh, to gape is to look with your mouth, mouth open. Uh, like that. And they gawked, so like their eyes popped out like that. Uh, and were mute with amazement. If you're mute, it means that you're silent, like on like on a Zoom video call. 
they were mute with amazement so they just like stared and didn't say anything what did it mean that human and horse could develop this hue hue meaning color should grow to be grass green or greener still so how is it possible that a human and a horse could become green or even greener than grass like green enamel emboldened by bright gold like you know green porcelain uh decorated emphasized highlighted by bright gold some stood and stared then stepped a little closer so some of them kind of like step a bit closer like that to look look more intently drawn near to the knight to know his next move so they're sort of attracted forwards to see what he's going to do next they'd seen some sights meaning they'd, they'd seen some interesting things but this was something special a miracle or magic or so they imagined yet several of the lords were like statues in their seats so several of the lords the more important people at the party were sitting completely still left speechless and rigid speechless meaning mute rigid meaning uh, frozen still s completely still not risking a response meaning they weren't willing to take the risk to say anything the hall fell hushed so the hall became silent sh hush sh hush means be quiet the hall fell silent as if all who were present had slipped into sleep or some trance-like state. A trance-like state would be some sort of like weird hypnotized trance. So everyone's been shocked and stunned by the arrival of this green knight. No doubt. Definitely. But all was but not all were stunned and stilled by dread. So they weren't all stunned and frozen by fear, by dread, but they were duty bound. They were uh, obliged by duty to hold their tongues, to stay silent until their sovereign could respond. So that just means that the, the chivalric duty or the, maybe not chivalric duty, just the, 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 the rules of the court dictated that they had to stay silent because they had to wait for the king, for King Arthur, to respond. And it would have been very inappropriate for them to say anything before the king. So they had to stay silent for that reason so so they weren't necessarily afraid they were just um staying silent waiting for the king um ba, 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 ba. so basically the king i'm going to paraphrase a bit more the king then acknowledges the arrival of the green knight and uh manage king arthur keeps his cool and he welcomes the green knight introduces himself as arthur the head of the house and he, he invites the Green Knight to come out of the saddle and stay and tell everyone of the business which brings him to Camelot. No, he doesn't. He says, uh, come off your horse, stay a while. We'll talk about business later. Just come and join us for a bit. So he's sort of being cool and generous. But the knight is very serious and he says, no, it's not in my nature to wait or sit around this evening uh, because, um, but, he says, but because your acclaim is so loudly chorused, meaning because everyone speaks so highly of you and your castle and brotherhood are called the best, the strongest men to ever mount the saddle, so the strongest men ever to ride their horses around, the worthiest knights ever known to the world, both in competition and in true combat. And since courtesy, so it is said, is championed here, so the knight is saying, because you're considered to be the best knights and because you're very polite, I am I am interested to your I'm interested and attracted to your door. So your reputation is what attracted me here. Your reputation as great knights and uh, knights who have honourable, polite codes of behaviour, that's what attracted me to you. Um, be assured by this hollin stern here in my hand that I mean no menace. menace. Be assured by this hollin stem here in my hand that I mean no menace. So the knight says he's holding a, a branch of, I guess it's a branch of holly, 
um, um, a branch from a tree, uh, which he's bringing as a kind of a peace offering. So he's saying, look, I've got this. So I, I mean, you no know, menace. I'm not here to, to, I'm not here for bad reasons. So expect no malice. I'm not here to attack you. Because if I'd slogged here tonight to slay and slaughter, if I'd made my way here, if I'd made the long journey here tonight to kill and slaughter, my helmet and hauberk wouldn't be at home. So my helmet, you know, the thing that protects his head, and my hauberk? Is this a weapon? Is that one of those long weapons with a spike on the end? No. A hauberk Herb Herberk. Horberk. Horberk. Okay. So if I'd slogged here tonight to slay and slaughter, my helmet and hauberk wouldn't be at home. So basically, if I'd come here to to attack you, I would be wearing my helmet and my hauberk. Hauberk is a uh, a chain mail uh uh tunic. Uh a a, a kind of armor that uh, people used to wear to protect their, their bodies against swords and so on. Um, if I'd come here tonight to kill you, then I would have been wearing my armour. Um, and my sword and spear would be here at my side. I'd be carrying my sword and my spear. A spear is a long wooden um, weapon with a metal spike at the end that you would use to stab or throw. And more weapons of war, as I'm sure you're aware, uh, I'm clothed for, for peace, not knitted out for conflict. So the Green Knight is saying, look, I, I haven't come here for a fight. I've come here. Look, if I was looking for a fight, I'd be all dressed up for it, but I'm not. And if you're half as honourable as I've heard folks say, you'll gracefully grant me this game, which I ask for by right. So he's, he's come for a game. He's come to challenge them to some kind of game. Then Arthur answered, Knight most courteous, you claim a fair unarmoured fight. We'll see you have the same. So Arthur assumes that the guy is coming to challenge someone to a one-to-one -one fight. And the, okay, so the, again, I'll paraphrase a little bit because I want to skip forward a, a, a bit. So the Green Knight says, I'm not looking for a fight, honestly, I swear. Besides, a lot of the, a lot of the people here are a bit too young for that. And if, I'd, if I had come here to fight, then some of these kids would not last a minute against me. But it's Christmas time, right? So at Christmas, I'm going to give you a challenge, a kind of a game. And we'll see who is brave enough to do this. He said, um, I lay down a challenge. If a person here present within these premises is big or bold or red-blooded enough to strike me one stroke and be struck in return, I shall give him as a gift this gigantic cleaver and the axe shall be his to handle how he likes. I'll kneel, bare my neck and take the first knock. So who has the gall, the gumption, the guts, who will spring from his seat and snatch this weapon? I offer the axe. Who will have it as his own? I'll afford one free hit from which I won't flinch and promise that 12 months will pass in peace. Then claim the duty I deserve in one year and one day. Does no one have the nerve to wager in this way? Okay, so let's go back through that. So basically the challenge, he's saying, who is big, confident, red-blooded enough to strike me once and be struck in return? So this is where he gives the, the uh, rules of the game. So he's saying, basically, you can take my axe and you can strike me one time. And then I will have the right to strike you in return. And if you can do that, I'll give you this axe as a gift. And he said, I'll even kneel down and I'll bare my neck. I'll part my hair and show you my neck and I'll take the first hit. So who has the gall? Who's got the guts? The gumption, you know, who's got the, the strength of character? Who will spring from his seat 
Who will jump up from his seat and, and snatch this weapon and take it? I'll offer, I offer the axe. Who will have it as his own? So who's going to claim to take this axe and keep it? I'll afford one free hit from which I won't flinch. So he's saying, I'll, I'll give you one free hit. I won't flinch. Flinch is when you sort of <laughs> move in order to avoid a hit. Sort of thing that kids do at school. Like they go to hit you. And then when you flinch, they go, ah, I made you flinch. So flinch would be move to avoid being hit. And the Green Knight is saying, I will let you hit. I'll give you one free hit on me and I won't even try to avoid it. And then I promise that 12 months will pass in peace. And then I will claim the duty I deserve in one year and one day. So he's saying that in a year and a day, I will come back to claim my half of the bargain. Okay, so to paraphrase, paraphrase the next bit, basically the, the, the knights were all pretty confused and still didn't really know what to think and no one came forward and uh, the green knight started scoffing like, huh? He scoffed like that, sort of, huh? So this is the house of Arthur, is it? The famous house of King Arthur. This is Camelot, is it? You're so famous for your fearlessness and your bravery, but this is just bragging, isn't it? You're just, it's just big talk. The reputation of the round table has been completely destroyed by, by my challenge. Okay. And then he laughed at them all. Mm-hmm. He laughed really strongly at them. But Arthur stepped up and said to him this, Your request, he countered, is quite insane, and folly finds the man who flirts with the fool. No warrior worth his salt would be worried by your words, so in heaven's good name, hand over the axe, and I'll happily fulfil the favour you ask. He strides to him swiftly and seizes his arm. The man mountain dismounts in one mighty leap. Then Arthur grips the axe, grabs it by its haft, and takes it above him, intending to attack. Yet the stranger before him stands up straight, highest in the house by at least a head. Quite simply, he stands there, stroking his beard, fiddling with his coat, his face without fear, about to be bludgeoned, but no more bothered than a guest at the table being given a goblet of wine. By Guinevere, Gawain now to his king inclines and says, I stake my claim, this moment must be mine. So Arthur steps forward and say, don't be ridiculous. Your request, he counted, is quite insane. And folly finds the man who flirts with the fool. So folly is stupidness. Folly finds the man who flirts with the fool. So anyone who plays a game with a fool, with, an, with a stupid idiot like you, would also be doing something stupid. So this is, this is ridiculous. And my men are far more wise and clever and sensible than to play some silly game like this. No warrior worth his salt. No warrior who is worth... Um, the val his value in salt. So the same, mm, if you're worth your salt, it means you're worth the same value as your weight in salt. So if I'm 80 kilograms, let's say, is my value the same as 80 kil kilograms of salt? Am I worth something, basically? So no warrior worth his salt, no warrior who's worth, who's worth something would be worried by your words. No decent warrior would be concerned by this. This is a silly game. Now, just give us the axe. Give me the axe and I will do the favour that you ask. Meaning, come on, I'll get rid of you. Okay, he strides to him swiftly and seizes his arm. So, Arthur, who's a bit hot-headed, steps over and grabs the guy's arm. And the man mountain dismounts from his horse in one mighty leap. So he just, boom, leaps off the horse, doof, lands on the ground. But Arthur grips the axe. He takes the axe and, and grabs it by its haft. 
I suppose this is the handle of the axe, and takes it above him, intending to attack. So he grabs the axe, lifts it above him, but the stranger just stands up straight. And he is highest in the house by at least a head. So he's taller than everyone else in the room by at least a head. And quite simply, he stands there stroking his beard. So he just stands stroking his beard, fiddling with his coat. His face without fear. So he's not bothered at all. Well, while Arthur's got the axe over his head, he's about to be bludgeoned, meaning he's about to be hit with this axe, but no more bothered than a guest at the table being given a goblet of wine. So he's not bothered, no more than he would be if he was being someone was about to hand him a glass of wine. Oh, thanks. Instead, Arthur's about to hit him with an axe, and the guy's just like, mm-hmm, nah, not bothered. And at this point, Gawain, who is Arthur's nephew, sitting next to Guinevere, the queen, the beautiful queen, uh, Gawain now moves towards King Arthur and he says, okay, I stake my claim. So I claim this challenge. This moment must be mine. So this, at this point, uh, Gawain steps in and says, right, this is my moment. I'll do this. Okay. Let's see what Gawain said. We're getting near the end of this passage. Okay, everybody. I don't know how long I've been, I've been talking, but let's keep going. Let's crack on. So, should you call me courteous lord, said Gawain to his king, to rise from my seat and stand at your side, politely take leave of my place at the table and quit without causing offence to my queen, then I shall come to your council before this great court, for I find it unfitting as my fellow knights would, when a deed of such daring is dangled before us, that you take on this trial, tempted as you are, when brave, bold men are seated on these benches, men never matched in the metal of their minds, never beaten or bettered in the field of battle, I am weakest of your warriors and feeblest of wit. Loss of my life would be grieved the least. Were I not your nephew, my life would mean nothing. To be born of your blood is my body's only claim. Such a foolish affair is unfitting for a king. So being first to come forward, it should fall to me. And if my proposal is improper, let no other person stand blame. The knighthood then unites, and each knight says the same. Their king can stand aside and give Gawain the game. So basically, Sir Gawain steps up and says, look, uh, this is this. it's not appropriate for you, the king, to do this. And I think that I should be the one to do it. And especially when there's all these other knights around who could be doing this, I think that one of us should be doing it instead. And I propose myself because I am not you know, I'm the weakest and not the most intelligent one of all of us. And so it doesn't really matter if I get killed. So he basically kind of is willing to sacrifice himself, which is pretty heroic, I would say. So should you call me courteous lord, meaning if you ask, if you want me to, said Gawain, to, to rise from my seat, to get up and stand at your side, and politely take leave of my place at the table, meaning politely uh, leave my place here at the table and quit without causing offence to my queen, meaning and, and leave without offending the queen who I'm sitting with. If you want me to come, then I shall come to your council. I'll come to your help before this great court in front of everybody. For I find it unfitting, meaning I, I find it un, uh, inappropriate as my fellow knights would, meaning I'm sure that all the rest of us also think it would be inappropriate, when a deed of such daring is dangled before us, a deed, an act of such daring, uh, an act, a daring act, a, 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 an act that requires a lot of courage and bravery, when this is dangled before us, if something is dangled, it's kind of like held out in front um, as an offer, meaning, oh, come on, take this. Like you might dangle. Uh, video viewers can see I'm dangling my Casio digital watch in front of you. Oh, come and take it if you can. 
it's not exactly the most valuable item I have to dangle in front of you. Um, it's, a, it's just a Casio digital watch. It's probably worth about 30 pounds. But ah, there it is. I'm dangling it in front of you. I'm holding it out, letting it fall down and swing left to right, offering it for you to try and take. I'm dangling it. So um, he's saying when this um, this dangerous and uh, daring act is offered to us, it's inappropriate that, that you, the king, should should be doing this challenge. Even though you want to do it, even though you are tempted, it's inappropriate for you to be doing this when you're surrounded by all these other brave men, who men uh, who've never been matched in the metal of their minds, meaning... Um, um, in the metal of their minds, in the in the sort of quality or ability of their minds, or the strength, the strength of their minds, metal, m e t t l e, um, mental ability in difficult circumstances, a test of your mental strength, a test of your metal. Okay, so the you know when you're surrounded by these strong-minded. Um, brave, bold men who've never been beaten or bettered when no one has been better than them in the field of battle. And so he says, I propose myself. I'm the weakest of your warriors. I'm the feeblest, that's weakest, of wit. Wit means your mental ability. I'm the weakest and least intelligent and loss of my life, meaning if I died, uh, you know, the loss of my life would be grieved the least, meaning people would miss me uh, less than some of the other people here. He's got, he seems to have fairly a fairly low opinion of himself, uh, or maybe he's just modest. But surely these these are the these are some of the um, traits of a of a hero. I would say. He's saying, "Were I not your nephew, my life would mean nothing." Meaning, if I if I weren't your nephew my life would mean nothing. So the only value I have is the fact I'm the nephew of the king. So maybe Gawain here is feeling like, you know, he needs to prove himself. Maybe he's feeling a bit sort of, um, you know, under... What's the word for it? Maybe he feels like he needs to improve it. Maybe he feels he needs to prove himself because he just thinks all I am is the, the nephew of the king. And so I need to try and prove that I am actually capable of something. Um, to be born of your blood is my body's only claim. So the only thing I can claim, the only achievement I've ever made is the fact that I was born of your blood, meaning that I'm related to you. Such a foolish affair is unfitting for a king. Such a sort of ridiculous game is not appropriate for a king. So being first to come forward, it should fall to me. So basically, I think I should do this. And if my proposal is improper, let no other person stand blame. Meaning if, if, if I'm speaking out of line, if I'm being rude here, if I've offended you, King Arthur, then it's in my fault entirely, and I would take all the blame. The knighthood then unites, and each knight says the same. Their king can stand aside and give Gawain the game. So all the other knights say, oh yeah, okay, it should be, it should be Gawain. All the others like, yeah, 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 let him do it. Yeah, fine. <laughs> Either, I don't know, either they say it like that, yeah, yeah, fine, or they're like, yes, it should be going. They all agree. Okay, um, we've just got a, maybe one, maybe two more verses of this left. Okay, so here we go. So the sovereign instructed his knight to stand. Getting to his feet, he moved graciously forward and knelt before Arthur, taking hold of the axe. Letting go of it, Arthur then held up his hand to give young Gawain the blessing of God and hope he finds firmness in heart and fist. Take care, young cousin, to catch him cleanly. Use full-blooded force, then you needn't fear the blow which he threatens to trade in return. Gawain, with the weapon, walked towards the warrior, and they stood face to face, not one man afraid. Then the green knight spoke, growled at Gawain. Before we compete, repeat what we've promised, and start by saying your name to me, sir, and tell me the truth so I can take it on trust. In good faith, it's Gawain, 
said the God-fearing knight. I heave this axe, and whatever happens after, in twelve months' time I'll be struck in return, with any weapon you wish, and by you and you alone. The other answers, says, Well, by my living bones, I welcome you, Gawain, to bring the blade head home. Okay, so the sovereign, the king, instructed his knight to stand. So King Arthur said, okay, stand up. Getting to his feet, he moved graciously forward. Um, so standing up, he moved forward graciously. Graciously, yeah. Graciously means in a, in a well-mannered way. If you're gracious, it means you're, you are pleasant and polite and well-mannered. He moved graciously forward, sort of modestly I, I, as well, I would say and knelt before Arthur, taking hold of the axe. So he went down on his knee and took the axe. Letting go of it, Arthur then held up his hand to give young Gawain the blessing of God. Okay? So uh, Arthur let, the, let Gawain take the axe, and then he raised his hand to give uh, Gawain a, the, a blessing from God. And hope he finds firmness in heart and fist. Firmness, strength, solidness, solidity in heart so that he would be able to do it and fist so that he'd be able to hold the axe strongly. Take care, young cousin, to catch him cleanly. Meaning make sure you, you hit him with a good strike. Use full-blooded force, meaning use all your strength then you needn't fear the blow which he threatens to trade in return. So if you use good strength and you hit him properly, then you don't need to worry about the fact he's going to try and hit you in return. Because if you hit him strongly, you'll kill him with one blow, and then you don't need to worry about this anymore. Gawain, with the weapon, walked towards the warrior. Fine. And they stood face to face, not one man afraid. Then the Green Knight spoke growled at Gawain. So growl is something that animals do. That's the growl. So I guess when the knight spoke, he spoke like this. Before we compete, repeat what we've promised. And start by saying your name to me, sir. And tell me the truth so I can take it on trust. So basically, before, before we start, you've got to promise, you know, the rules and Repeat the promise that we've agreed and tell me your name and, and tell me the truth so I can believe you. And Gawain said, in good faith, meaning honestly, it's Gawain. And the God-fearing knight, that's Gawain. Uh, in, in good faith, it's Gawain, said the God-fearing knight. I heave this axe, meaning I, I lift this axe, so I you know, strike with this axe. And whatever happens after, in 12 months' time, I'll be struck in return. So 12 months later, you can strike me, you can hit me with it, with any, with any weapon you wish, any weapon you want, and by you and you alone. So he kind of, you know, shows that he've underst he's understood the terms of the agreement, this covenant, um, the rules of the game. The other answers, so the Green Knight says, well, by my living bones, I welcome you, Gawain, to bring the blade head home. So I welcome you to do this, to strike me with the head of this axe. Okay, do you want to know what happens? So basically, to paraphrase the next bit, the Green Knight says, okay, uh, I'm glad that it's you who's going to do this because you've, you've perfectly repeated the terms of this con contest, but you must swear to seek me yourself and that you will search me to the ends of the earth to earn the same blow as you'll give me today. And uh, Gawain says, where will you be? Where do you live? You're a man of mystery. Where do you come from? What's your name? There is knowledge I need, including your name. Strangely, the green, the green knight says, okay, I'll tell you, but I'll tell you after you've hit me. I'll give you the details when, I've hit, when you've hit me. And then the Green Knight says, but you're wasting time. Now take that axe and show me your striking style. 
Okay, so let's continue. In the standing position, he prepared to be struck, bent forward, revealing a flash of green flesh as he heaped his hair to the crown of his head, the nape of his neck now naked and ready. Gawain grips the axe and heaves it heavenwards, plants his left foot firmly on the floor in front, then swings it swiftly towards the bare skin. The cleanness of the strike cleaved the spinal cord and parted the fat and the flesh so far that the bright steel blade took a bite from the floor. The handsome head tumbles onto the earth, and the king's men kick it as it clatters past. Blood gutters brightly against his green gown. Yet the man doesn't shudder or stagger or sink, but trudges towards them on those tree trunk legs and rummages around, reaches at their feet and cops hold of his head and hoists it high and strides to his steed, snatches the bridle, steps into the stirrup and swings into the saddle, still gripping his head by a handful of hair. Then he settles himself in his seat with the ease of a man unmarked, never mind being minus his head. And when he wheeled about, his bloody neck still bled. His point was proved. The court was deadened now with dread. So, <clears throat> basically the, the Green Knight leans forward and moves his hair up like that, revealing his neck. And Gawain grips the axe and heaves it heavenward, so he lifts it up into the air, plants his left foot firmly on the floor in front to get a good position, swings it swiftly towards the bare skin, swung the axe towards the skin of the, the Green Knight's neck. The cleanness of the strike cleaved the spinal cord. So the strike was so clean that it went straight through the neck and the spinal cord parted the fat and flesh so far, so it went straight through uh, the, that the bright steel blade took a bite from the floor. So it went through the neck and then pang hit the floor all the way down. Like a perfect strike. The handsome head tumbles onto the earth. So the head fell off onto the earth and the king's men kick it as it clatters past. So it fell between everyone's feet and they kicked it around a bit. Blood gutters brightly against his green gown, so the blood poured out onto the green gown of the Green Knight. Yet the man doesn't shudder or stagger or sink, so the Green Knight didn't shake or, or lose control or fall down, but trudges towards them on those tree trunk legs, so instead he just walked forwards, right, towards them, on those big thick green legs and rummages around, sort of like puts his hands around, reaches at their feet and cops hold of the head. So grabs the head and lifts it up, hoists it high and strides to his steed. So takes these strong confident steps back to his horse, snatches the bridle, all right? Snatches the, the, the reins, the straps of the horse, steps into the stirrup, the little uh, metal loop that the foot goes into on the horse and swings all the way into the saddle, still gripping his head, still holding his head by a handful of hair. Then he settles himself in his seat with the ease of a man unmarked. So he settled himself down, all comfortable as if he hadn't even been touched. Never mind being minus his head. And then he wheeled about, he turned round, his bloody neck still with blood coming out, and he proved his point. The court was now deadened, uh, was now quiet with fear. Not sure exactly what, pro what point he proved. It's not entirely sure, not entirely certain. Um, then, the, the, uh, then the skull in his hand spoke to Gawain and said, Sir Gawain, be wise enough to keep your word and faithfully follow me until I'm found as you vowed, as you promised in this hall within hearing of these horsemen. So everyone has heard the promise. Now you've got to keep your word. Uh, you're charged with getting to the green chapel. So you're charged, meaning you are obliged to 
you're compelled to find your way to the Green Chapel. This is where the Green Knight lives. To reap what you have sown, meaning to collect what you've what you've created. To reap what you've sown, this actually comes from um, the idea of farming. So you sow seeds, meaning you plant seeds in the ground, and then the, the, the crops grow, and then you, you cut those crops down and collect them. You reap those crops. So you, to reap what you've sown is to basically take the consequences of your actions. You'll rightfully receive the justice you are due just as January dawns. Men know my name as the Green Chapel Knight, and even a fool couldn't fail to find me. So come, or be called a coward forever. With a tug of the reins, he twisted around, and head still in hand, galloped out of the hall. So the hooves brought fire from the flame in the flint. So the hooves, the feet of the, ho of the horse, as they clattered across the stone floor, the, the hard flint stone of the floor, that sparks came out fire came from the hooves as they clattered across the um, the flint of the stone on the floor. Presumably this horse is wearing metal uh, horseshoes. Which kingdom he came from they hadn't a clue, no more than they knew where he made for next. And then, well, with the green man gone, they laughed and grinned again, and yet such goings on were magic to those men. Right, so that's where we're going to end it here. Um, I, there you go. What do you think of that? I thought it could be interesting just to read those lines to you, just to give you a sense of the descriptive and poetic language uh, in, this, in this poem. Again, all credit go for this goes to uh, Simon Armitage for the translation, the modern translation of this. He's done a fantastic job. The book is available in all decent bookshops. Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, the Simon Armitage version. You could also check out the J.R.R. Tolkien version, which is more of a, it's, it's less uh, poetic. It's more of a standard story. Um, it's not written in lines like this. That might be a good one to read too, a good telling of the story. Uh, but there you go. If you want to find out what happened, you could, yeah, read the book yourself and finish it off. Or you could go back to the previous episode if you haven't already heard that. If you've already heard episode 778, then you know what happens in the whole story. If you haven't heard episode 778, then you can go back and listen to it. My podcast is available wherever you get your podcasts. It's called Luke's English Podcast. You can get it in all the usual podcast apps. Uh, so listen to my show and like and subscribe and all the rest of it. I hope you've enjoyed this. Let me know. Leave your comments um, to tell me what you thought of this. Quite advanced level stuff. Lots of very descriptive language and so on. Uh, but I hope that you've enjoyed it and that you've enjoyed spending this time with me. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. And I will speak to you again soon. But for now, it's time to say goodbye. Bye, 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 bye.